Now, I want to ask you um, a question. We, we often speak to our friends uh, and we, or, or even people we meet and we say to them, what do you do? Don't you do that? Do you do that? What do you do d- during the week? That's usually the first question we ask. We go, what do you do for work? Now, what is often the first two words of the, of the response of the person, do you think? Often. What do they say? I'm a, that's definitely one. What else? I just, you heard that one? We say, hey, what do you do for work? I just serve sandwiches. And so I hear that and it makes me cringe because they're kind of destroying what they do. They have a low view of what they do. Believe it or not, uh, a couple of years ago, I was was teaching scripture uh, at a local school uh, in Peakhurst and the, the teacher that was sitting with me was, a, was a, a Christian, went to the local Baptist church. And as I was teaching, at the end of the lesson, she came up to me and she said, oh, it's so great what you do. I love it. I love, you know, you pastors get to teach the Bible. Um, she said, um, I don't see how what I do is as important as what you do. And my jaw just dropped. My jaw dropped, my heart broke. And I said to her, you get to see these kids a lot more than I do. You get to express God's goodness to them and his excellencies to them in a way that I could never do. I said, yeah, I probably get them 30 minutes a week. I said, don't dilute or destroy what it is that you do. God has, you are made in the image of God and you have got a lot to offer and you should enjoy your work. Too often in our churches and in the world, there is this kind of divide that happens with work. There are people who see spiritual work as up here and secular work as something else. Now, God doesn't look at it like that. All of our work carries with it dignity, and when we do it uh, in honor of the Lord Jesus, um, he is pleased. You with me? All right. Now, another common question is, people go, well, don't I just work to just get paid? Is that all it is? Have you heard that one before? I just work to get paid. I've fallen into that. I've seen work as just a thing that we do to get money. Um, A lot of Christians throughout their time have asked, is there more to what I'm doing than just feeding my family and not feeling guilty about the money that I might be making? And so this is what we're going to look at. And now my aim is tonight that we would all walk away with a more fuller um, experience Uh, of personal dignity and divine purpose in the very jobs that we all do as we serve God. No matter how isolated our Mondays are, friends, um, it may seem so distant from Sunday, but God wants us to enjoy our work throughout the week as well. I want us to realize that as we go out because it will invigorate our working week. Otherwise, it just feels pretty boring and pretty monotonous and then you end up quitting. All right, so what are we going to do? We're going to look first at what is work. Who would like to be brave enough and give me a definition of how they would define work? Or do you want me to just give it to you? Who's brave enough to come up with a definition? Anyone? Enjoyment? That's good. Anyone want to build on that? Way to spend time. I like it. These are two broad definitions of work. Sorry, what was that? Not resting. Very interesting. Very interesting. Here's a definition I really like. Work is what creatures do with God's creation. I like it because it's broad. This says that work is more than just getting paid. If you think about it, when I walked into the office this morning, did I work? Did work happen when I flipped on the light switch or when I pulled out my laptop or answered my first email or sat down to start writing? We might say we might work because we might say it started by doing something that was connected with what I was getting paid for. That's what some people do. But if you think about it, a lot of us have mowed grass at home And we've never been paid for that. And we'd all agree that that's hard work, right? If you cut grass for a living and you get paid for it, well, that's a different story as well. 
When we think that work happens only when we get paid, we end up reducing work as a means to an end. And this can cause a lot of problems. It can cause problems like burnout. It undervalues the meaning of work, like parenting, or volunteer roles, or caregiving. And ultimately, it robs us of the joy and the purpose of work. So where does work take place? Wherever people interact with God's world, whether planting beetroots or planting churches, raising children, driving to the office, writing a song, writing an email, it's work. Now, what will help us see things a little bit clearer is a very old word. It's the word called vocation. You heard of vocation? Vocation, it just means calling and it originates in what God has called us to do with our lives. It refers to our purpose and, and, and calling, and it encompasses all aspects of life, not just what we do when we get paid. And so all, each and every single one of us have more than one vocation. I have a vocation of a pastor, of a father, of a citizen of Australia. Do you see where I'm going with this? And in all these places, I'm called to work in a different way, but I am working nonetheless. We have vocations in family, community, church, and work, and we work differently in each and every single one of those. So changing nappies at home is much as an exercise of loving God and loving neighbor as delivering meals, as printing bulletins at church, as mowing lawns for income. Each of them is important and it demands our faithfulness. Now... A good question would be, we've defined work, why do we work? Why do we work? Put simply, we work because our creator works and we are made in his image and to reflect him. You see, we are designed to work because he, the designer, works. And we see that in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, but I'm going to pick up these couple of verses, they're not coming up. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And in Genesis 1.31, we see God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning the sixth day. So you see, God works. He's the creator. He works, and so we work as his image bearers. It says it again in Genesis 2, thus the heavens and the earth were completed in all their vast array. By the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Now, just in case we read that verse and we end up thinking, well, look, God's resting now and not working. Jesus has got something to say to us about that. In John 5, he says, my father is always at his work to this very day and I too am working. God is the ultimate workman, which tells us that the act of work itself has inherent meaning and significance and dignity. One Bible dictionary has this to say about work. God has infused, I don't know how I feel about it, I like it, hear me out. God has infused the act of work with meaning and divine significance, enjoining upon humans an obligation to engage in work even as God does. So we work because our creator works and we're made in his image to reflect him. That's what we were designed to do. And we see that again in Genesis 2 verse 15. It says, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. We work something, we make it flourish. When we keep it, we sustain it, we preserve it. We don't waste it, we don't abuse it. The Lord told Adam, in his first job description, he's saying, I'm calling you to production and conservation. In other words, we are co-laborers under God in his creation care. That's our job description, friends. That's our labor. That's our mission. Notice, in Genesis 2, it comes before Genesis 3, right? Not a trick thing which means our call to work happened before the fall, before the entrance of human sin. A lot of people think that 
Work is a product of the fall and that it's bad or it's cursed. Genesis 2 wants to remind us that work is good. It is not a product of the fall. Work is a product of creation. In fact, creation is a first product of God's work and then our work is a part of God's creation. God is now in the business of, work, of the work of redemption and the work of recreation. I mean, this is what Jesus said. He said, I must work the work of him who sent me while it is day for the night is coming when no man can work. Friends, work is not the product of the fall. It is the difficulty and the opposition that we face in our work that is the product of the fall. And quite frankly, it's our attitude, including me, to the work that is the product of the fall. But we work because our God created us to work. Newsflash also, though, we're going to work in the new heaven and the new earth. Now, I don't know how you feel about that. I like that. That's a blessing. That's awesome. Because when we don't work, we feel like we're not human. So work is not a product of the fall. It happens before it shows that in a perfect world, we're going to work. And work is good. This means that work is a gift and it's a blessing to each and every one of us, no matter what it is that we do. Obviously, selling drugs for a job is not necessarily a blessing. God doesn't want to honor that. But honest work that we can say, yeah, I work for the Lord in, God sees that as a good thing. It's important to understand that it's a good gift because I don't know about you, sometimes we say to ourselves, I do this sometimes, if I just didn't have to work, life would be so pleasant. And you're smiling because you've all thought that or said that. But work is good. It's our attitude, isn't it? Our attitude is a product of the fall and sin has stained the way in which we approach work, look at work. And so we end up with either being lazy and God doesn't like that or being workaholics and God will say, I don't like that as well. So, work is good. Another observation um, that we see in the first couple of Gen- uh, in the, sorry in the first chapter of Genesis, Genesis one verse twenty six, it says, "Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock, and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground." So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God created us as image bearers. We are actually given a dignity above everything else in the universe. Genesis tells us that you and I are people created in the image of God before he assigned the task. This is really important. This is significant, particularly in our day and age. Before we are told what to do as work, we are told who we are in God's eyes. It's important to keep this in mind. God is saying, I'm not determining whether you're an image bearer based on what you can accomplish or what you are going to accomplish. No, you're an image bearer because I created you and I made you in my image. Well, this is why we value the people who are unborn, the frail, Regardless of whether or not they can contribute, we still value them because they're image bearers. Now, this impacts the way in which we work with people in our workplaces or when when we work as we come across people in whatever thing that we do when it comes to working on creation, that if they're not doing the thing well, they might not be doing the thing well, but they're still image bearers and we still need to respect them and love them. We might want to tell them, hey, this is probably not for you, but we still need to respect them. When we truly grasp this kind of profound beauty of of the value that God has placed on work, particularly on us before work, uh, it helps us to not compete with others. And it helps us as we go in our jobs to go, I am loved by God, I'm an image bearer, whether I'm a surgeon or a pharmacist or a baker or a candlestick maker. And it frees us up to live in a way that just kind of oozes the excellencies of God to a world that is watching. So friends, you're an image bearer, not because of what you do, but because of who you are. So you could be the prime minister and that's great. And you could be somebody else, like a baker or a patisserie maker. I love cannoli, so I had to say that. 
um, and it's equal in dignity in the Lord's eyes. Now, here's a question. So we've worked out why do we work, but what is the purpose of our work? So we, what is the purpose of our work? Why did God create us so that we would have to work? Why do we have this desire to perform work or useful work? I mean, if you think about it, what's the difference between a human and the rest of creation? This is a question I like to ask a lot as I look at things in the Bible. I mean, rocks and hills don't work. Plants don't carry any conscious work. I mean, they keep growing, but they don't work. Human beings have to work. There are several reasons, and I haven't thought of all of them, because there, there are many, but they all fall under, I believe, a general category. And the Apostle Paul tells us in Colossians 3, verse 17, he says, And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And just so we know that the word everything includes our workplaces and everything else that we do in terms of working with creation, Paul says in verse 23, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. So God gave us work so that we would glorify him. That's the general category. Work is an act, yeah, some guy, that's me, I didn't want to write Dan, it's just, it's weird. <laughs> Work is an act of worship. Humans are made in the image of God, we're made to glorify him and enjoy him forever. You could say that all of life is made up of either working, uh, sorry, serving God or worshipping God, you can look at them synonymously, and so given that that's the case, our work is an act of worship. A massive way to do this is by reflecting God's character, his excellencies in serving others in participation on his mission in the world. So our work is deeply connected to God's purpose for humanity, making it more than just a means to an end, but a vital part of living out our faith, no matter what we're doing for our work. So work is given so that we would glorify God. And I said we do this in multiple ways, but I don't have an exhaustive list. I do have eight things that I think will help us actually see work in a new light that will help us enjoy it. Are you with me? Point one, work gives us the privilege of creating something new, imitating God's creativity. Work gives us the privilege of creating something new, imitating God's creativity. When we work to create new things, we imitate God's creativity, his wisdom, his skill, his strength, his intelligence, and many other attributes to the world who, are, who is watching us. Now, I think we've lost the wonder of this and take things for granted so easily, but I just I want your imaginations with me. Imagine if we could put Adam and Eve right here, right, in a time capsule. Let's just say we could bring him here into this room and, you know, let's clothe them appropriately uh, because they're probably not clothed well. They, they'd look around and, and Adam might say, hey, Dan, what's this? And imagine I had a bottle of water here. What's this? And I'd say, oh, that's water. Are you thirsty? He'd, he'd take it and he'd have a drink. Wow. You didn't have to go to a stream bend down to get water. You just have it in this little container that's clear. Yes. Where did you get this thing? Well, Adam, God put materials in the earth that allowed us to invent that plastic bottle that carries the water. Really? That's amazing. Wait, how did you know how to make this with the materials? Well, Adam, God gave us wisdom, skill, curiosity, letting us investigate and gain more knowledge of his creation, and suddenly we have a bottle of water. Adam would say, praise be to God. He put those resources in the earth and gave you the wisdom to understand them and make them. What an amazing God. And now he's praising God and he's worshipping him. And then he might go on and say, I thought it was nighttime, Dan, here at MBM. What, what are those things up in the... Are they, are they stars? No, they're not stars, Adam. We made them out of the earth too. Really? Praise God that he gave you the wisdom to understand how to make them. And we would say, yes, Adam, it was a man named Thomas Edison, but we'll get to that later. And you can turn these on any time, day or night, to have light, see each other, worship together. Yep. How do you think Adam would react? 
he would be overflowing with praise to who? To God. For his goodness and his kindness and his provision. And we could say, hey Adam, look mate, I can give you a mobile phone, you can give Eve a call later on. Do you get the point? It would freak him out, but he would attribute everything to God and it would cause him to worship God all the more. We are imitating God's creative activity and this is good for humanity. It is good for civilization. Now we'll never be the same as God. He creates out of nothing. We create out of existing matter. But in our work, we are fulfilling Ephesians 5, being imitators of God as beloved children. Just as God is love and delights in us acting in love, he delights in us acting in love. Just as he is truth, he delights in us acting in truth and telling truth. And so as we work and create these new things that help society and help people advance and and provide health and care and all this kind of stuff, we're actually displaying the excellencies of our creator to a watching world and to the angels who are observing us as well. It's amazing, isn't it? So God made us to enjoy this. So if you're baking a cake or grilling a steak or inventing something new, God has given you that. You're working through creation and it is a blessing. And if you see it that way, it will cause you to praise God and give thanks to him. And God is honored by that. You see, animals can work, right? Horses and oxen can plow, if you think about it. Dogs can herd sheep or can they, they can act as watchdogs. But only humans can create, invent or innovate. No watchdog has ever built an electric fence to keep the sheep in. And not only that, no watchdog after doing that has said, hey, you know what's a great idea? Let's sell it to all the other dogs so that they don't have to work. (laughs) Our ability to work shows the excellence of our human nature as we are created by God. And it shows everyone else how awesome our God is as we are working with him in his creation as he seeks to move everything to the renewed creation. So that's the first one. The second one is... Work gives us the privilege of creating value, imitating God's creativity. There's a bit of an overlap here. The first one was creating something new. And as we create new things, it's helpful for society. But this is different. We're creating value with stuff that's already happened. And it gives us that privilege of imitating God's creativity here. We might not invent something new, but when we work to produce the same thing and again and again and again, we are adding value to this world and we are helping people around us and society and civilization. I'll give you an example. Say I buy a cotton ball for five bucks, I make a jumper out of that cotton ball, and I sell it for 20 bucks. I've added value and I have created something useful that is gonna be a blessing to others, but I'm also being blessed as well as I sell it. This process of work adds value throughout history, allowing us to be where we are today. The comforts that we have today, it's people have looked at creating new things and then adding value to those new things that have allowed us to sit on these chairs, have this thing and all this tech that we've got up here. And this applies to service industries as well. This is not just about material things. Think about it. Where would civilization be without teachers? Or nurses? Or doctors? Or surgeons? Imagine we didn't have any of that. Where would we be? Where would we be without people who drive those garbage trucks that wake my kids up at five o'clock in the morning? And with their squeaky brakes. Where would we be? There is a value in having a home free of termites. I like the termite company. I don't want my house to collapse on my head. So there is a value. They add value even in their service. You know, there was a research that was done uh, by a non-Christian person looking in the business world about what makes people happiest at work. Believe it or not, money wasn't in the top two. But you know what was? What he called earned success. That is, having a responsibility and doing it well. That gave people this thing where they were like, I love this and I love to be here. This is exactly what God is bestowing upon us. It's good when we work and we enjoy our work. The next point, 
We glorify God. Work gives us the privilege of doing good to and for one another, imitating God's love. You and I are all made different. You and I all have different skills and preferences, and I'm thankful to God for that because if we all had the same skill set, we would probably have the same colored brick houses everywhere, and we probably wouldn't have mobiles or chairs or anything else. Because we're different and we have a different set of skills, we have different activities that we want to put our time and invest our energy in, which produces a lot of things for each other. Horses don't have teams. I've been using horses a lot, sorry. Horses don't have teams where one of them brings them water and another brings them hay. Each one has to go get their own water. Each one has to go and get their own hay. But humanity works together to help each other flourish and continue to develop and continue to work and provide better things for our society and culture. And basically allowing God in our work to spread his kingdom in and around us. It's essential to society and it's essential to our culture. Let me give you an example and I want you to again use your imagination. Think of a simple wooden chair, the most simplest wooden chair that you can think of. Now I want to ask you, could you make it yourself? If you had enough time, could you make it yourself? I would say that most of us would be able to say yes. Say you do in fact go and buy the wood that's needed, the nails, the glue, and maybe the stuffing if you don't want it just fully wooden, the springs and put it all together. But if by making the chair, I mean just assembling each part from scratch, that's quite another matter. How did we get the wood the way we needed it? Did you go and chop a tree down? Did you have the tools to chop that tree down? Did you have the car to bring the wood, that big tree, to your house and the mill to kind of work the lumber? Do you see what I'm getting at? We need each other. And we need our differences for society to thrive and flourish. So if you were to make that chair the way I just described, in your lifetime you would make two chairs because it would be so hard. We'd be physically unable to do it, which is why we we need each other, which is why we're different, which is why all work is valuable when it's done to the glory and honor of the Lord Jesus. So when one person makes 100 T-shirts and another person grows... 2,000 tomatoes, my daughter asked me to put that word in there, she loves tomatoes, and other people produce cars and others produce computers, a huge network of human interdependency, what that does is it allows us to be interrelational um, as we continue to flourish as a society. And so in order for us to succeed, we need each other, and we need people to want what we're going to offer, and if they're not going to want it, we're going to move to something else to help them, which will then also help us. So when we interact in work, whatever that is, it's a win-win situation. We are helping each other and we are displaying God's excellencies to each other. Number four, after this section, I'll give you guys a break. Work gives us the privilege of relating to one another, depending on one another and serving one another in imitation of God's Trinitarian existence, God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit spirits we were not created to be hermits and if you're around in COVID time during lockdown we hated it even some of my introvert friends ended up hating it we need to interact with each other God made us to work so that we would interact with each other he made us different so that we would interact with each other as we would work he wanted us to relate to one another and relate um, reflect God's relationship to each other where he's image bearers, and he wants us to serve one another and depend on each other. The fifth thing that work does, or we're called to do, work gives us the privilege of supporting ourselves. So notice the first four things, it's about serving others, and as we do that, we're reflecting God's goodness, and we're also worshipping him. Now there's something that work does for us. It allows us to support our families. It allows us to care for our loved ones by the things that we might make or by the money that we might make that we would use to bless them. And as we do that, we we get a sense of dignity as we get to care and support somebody, our families or those who are loved by us. Six, work gives us the privilege of enjoying the fruits of our labor, imitating God's joy as, as as he looked at what he created. What did God do at the end of the sixth day? 
God saw everything that he had made and behold, everything was very good. Who was thinking that? God was. He looked at his, the work of his hands and he's like, that was great. I enjoy that. I reckon even on the seventh day as he was resting, he was like, that was awesome. And he wants us to t- take delight in that. And as we do, we are essentially saying to God, God, thank you for this wisdom and these skills that allowed me to do this and enjoy this. And therefore, we're actually now worshipping him even more. And so we're glorifying him. I'm moving through these fast. There's only two more. Number seven, work gives us the privilege of witnessing to unbelievers. This is a valid objective. Now, I left this here because too often I've heard preachers preach and basically the people sitting on the pews walk out thinking that the only reason why they go to work is to evangelize their friends. I want to say that's not the only reason why you go to work. We do witness, but you go to work because work is a good gift and you do things for others and, you, and you're getting stuff out of it and you're blessing a wider community. You know, think about the Woolworths truck driver. If he doesn't work, we don't get our toilet paper. We don't get our produce. Big impact. But there is a place for witnessing to unbelievers. We need to remember that. But I'll say that and I'll also say with a caveat, you're not a pastor in your workforce. And if you think that that's how you should spend large amounts of your time on your job, that's going to be frustrating to you. You're going to end up hating your job. And your boss might not like it. And in fact, God requires us to represent him with integrity, giving our energies and resources to the job we're hired to do. But by all means, always be prepared to give a reason for the hope you have. Now, these opportunities increase significantly as we consider the importance of how we work. So witness, but how we work matters. Our works at work are as important as our words. I want to say, if not more important. Jesus also tells us about how our witness becomes effective when he says in Matthew 5, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Our works are as important as our words, providing witness to God and his loving nature. Yes, your attitude is important. Your words are important. You know, if we quote Bible verses to people around us, I had one of these guys when I was at Ernst and Young, but have shoddy work practices, we destroy our witness. Same is true if we're continually late for work because we're at a Bible study or leading a prayer group. But by all means, there is a place to witness to, believers, uh, to unbelievers. Last one, work gives us the privilege to be generous to the church and the mission of God in this world. When we work, We are remunerated and sometimes we get paid quite a bit of money because we do a lot of good works. Even if we don't, it allows us to be generous with what God has blessed us and give back to him and to his mission in the world so that food banks, shelters, ministries that go out to people who are single or widows, we can translate Bibles to get them in the hands of people who need it. We can preach the gospel throughout the world. But... We will miss the deepest joys and neglect the most profound impact of our vocation if we do not recognize that our work is itself, is itself intended to extend the influence of God's kingdom to every corner of creation. So our work is valuable simply because God made it so, not because we're doing some Christian ministry in it. Now, some of you are in the banking industry, some of you might be in the legal industry, some of you are in the educational system. If if each of you were not doing your job, think about the impact that would have on our families and our churches and our communities. If we think about this downstream kind of impact of our work, each of us will gratefully kneel before God and say, I'm beginning to understand God. I'm not just a cog in a wheel somewhere. I've got a calling You've called me to make a difference in this world where I am at. And you're you're using me to make a better place in the space that I'm at. No matter how mundane your job is, you have a calling. I've got this diagram. I don't know if you can see it. Here's how vocation slash work works. God pours out his grace and goodness 
through us and through our vocations as friends and strangers, as neighbors, as family members, and as co-workers. And as a result of us being image bearers, he's working through us to kind of show a world how loving he is. And he's also working in the world through us. And that, so that's how, that's how this kind of thing works. That's how it is or what our purpose is as we work. I hope by now you're seeing that uh, work is not a means to an end, a means to just making money or a means to status. Work is more than that. Work is what creatures do with God's creation. And as we do that, we do it in a way that reflects his goodness. So whether we're changing nappies, whether we're mowing the lawn, uh, I've got a friend here who's Lawn Lords, he, it's his business actually, so he doesn't actually, he's over there, he's, uh, that's actually, he, this is income, he makes money out of this, this isn't just like me mowing my lawn, but it's still work nonetheless, if you need your lawn mode, uh, go and speak to him about that, Lawn Lords, he's just over there. So work is more than just making money, work is more than just going to work so that I can evangelize. Uh, it's way bigger than that. We are working with God as he continues to kind of work towards recreation and redemption and renewal later on. So that's it. Uh, we're going to look at how Christians are called to work. Remember, I used the word vocation. We have a calling in every sphere of life. And so how is it that we are called to work? This is what we're going to look at. And then we'll probably move into some Q&A. Like I said, this session's fairly short. I've just got to find my notes on this and then we'll go. How are Christians called to work? Now, I used this verse earlier, but I think it's very helpful uh, when it comes to what we think about it. We'll explain it. Colossians 3, verse 17, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. And then later on, a few verses later, he says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. So with these verses kind of in mind, how are Christians called to work, whether paid work or not? I think the first thing that they tell us, oh, I'm going to give you all of them in one go this time, don't worry about it. The first thing we're at least, there's more than that, but these are the four that I want to touch on. We are called to work as though we are working for the Lord. This means that our motivation is driven by God's character and his commands. As image bearers, we work because he creates and we want to be like him as much as we can, even though we will drop the ball. He commands us to work and we work, we trust his good commands and so we serve him as we work. So we work for the Lord. So you might be at work and I had this, I had a very nasty boss and I had a friend of mine saying to me, why do you just keep working and why do you keep letting her abuse you verbally and sometimes physically? I was, stuff was thrown at me and I said, I don't work for her ultimately. I ultimately work for the Lord. And so I'm going to put in my best efforts and I'm going to cop it and that's okay. There is a prisoner who was, sorry, he was an American. He wanted to do some mission work. He prayed, God, please help me go to North Korea and bridge the gap between North Korea and the rest of the world so that they can hear the gospel. So he went and he didn't take any work or any Bibles or anything like that, but he was writing down his prayers and somebody came across his prayers and then he got chucked in prison. And he was put in prison for 15 years and he was beaten up, the longest held in North Korea and a lot of the prison guards were saying, why do you do this? He said, I work for the Lord and I prayed for this. He was finally released and it was a big hoo-ha all over the world. And so essentially his life, his suffering witnessed to the world. And a lot of people came to faith, even people in North Korea. And also North Koreans got to see actually a lot of what's going on around the world. And potentially, I would suspect, they were impacted by God's work in many people. Just like that, we work, we work for the Lord. So if your boss is nasty, you still work for the Lord. Now that's not saying that you should just stay there be, and be a welcome mat. God gives us the freedom to go, you know what, if I can move, you've got the freedom to move. But in that moment, you still remember working for the Lord. The next one, we are called to work with excellence. I'm going to give you a long paragraph quote, which I don't normally like doing. 
That's why I don't have it on the screen, but you need to follow with me. A lady by the name of Dorothy Sayers says this. This is, this is really important to this point. The church's approach to an intelligent carpenter is usually confined to exhorting him not to be drunk and disorderly in his leisure hours and to come to church on Sundays. Are you with me so far? So a lot of the times churches say to people, hey, listen, just don't be drunk and come to church on Sundays. That's your job. She goes on to say, what the church should be telling him is this, that the very first demand that his religion makes upon him is that he should make good tables. Church, by all means, and decent forms of amusement, certainly, but what use is all that if in the very center of his life and occupation, he is insulting God with bad carpentry? No crooked table, legs, or ill-fitting drawers, drawers ever, I dare swear, she said, came out of the carpenter's shop at Nazareth. Nor if they did, could anyone believe that they were made by the same hand that made the heaven and the earth. No piety in the worker will compensate for work that is not true to itself, for any work that is untrue to its own technique is living a lie. Now, we're never going to make a table like the Lord Jesus did. But I think the point still stands. As image bearers, wherever we work, we work being proud of the job that we do and do it excellently. You know, my wife and I, and I've I can't believe I'm confessing this. We, as we drive through the neighborhoods, we often look at people's front yards and we look at whether or not the grass has just overtaken everything. Now, I'm sorry if that's you. Maybe after tonight, that won't be you. <laughs> we would often say to each other, if they're not busy and if there's ample time to get things done and if they're Christian, so heaps of kind of qualifiers, they're not representing God well by just the outside of their house. They're not taking care of the creation that's around them. If their neighbors know they're Christians and the neighbors know that they have the ability and all that kind of stuff and their grass is this high and you can't see their front door, they don't care for the creation. And so we often laugh about that. I know it sounds judgmental, but I judge my house that way as well, so that's okay, right? <laughs> The third one, we work with integrity. We are called to work with integrity. If we bear on us the name of the Lord Jesus, then we want to work in a way that reflects his nature. Now that's hard. That means being willing to ask this question. If Christ were to do my job, how would he do it? If Christ were writing my sermon, how would he do it? If Christ were changing my son's nappy, how would he do it? If Christ was disciplining my daughter, how would he do it? If Christ was mowing my front yard, how would he do it? We want to work with integrity because that's what people see as followers of the Lord Jesus. If our God is to be beautiful and attractive to a watching world and our hearts, he must be seen as true and trustworthy. You know, youth and young adults and even teenagers, they pick this up. They can spot a fake from a mile away. If we're adorning his nature and the name with the qualities of our work, then it must be true and trustworthy as well. Are you seeing what I'm saying here? Integrity is crucial. Now, there are consequences of working with integrity, isn't there? In the workplace, especially if your boss is not a Christian and they're asking you to do something pretty dodge. I remember in my accounting days, I got asked, I'm not going to say who because it's being recorded, um, to kind of cover up about $13 million because I could. And they said to me, look, if you do it, we'll promote you, you'll eventually might become a partner and so on. And I, I went, had the weekend to go home and think, if I don't do this, I will never get promoted ever again in this particular workplace. But if I do it, I will definitely get away with it from a worldly perspective and I would get promoted and I would be on the big bucks. I went home and I thought about it and I prayed. As I say that now, I'm like, did I really even need to pray? Lo and behold, I didn't do it. Soon after that, when they were looking at reducing people, the first people they thought to reduce, guess who? people that 
went to church on Sunday and they didn't work those extra hours, the people that didn't compromise. Integrity in the workforce means there are going to be consequences. It means we're going to suffer. But it means we're going to suffer for our saviour. Which, by the way, is another witness to God's excellencies. And we don't like that. Nobody does. But remember what Christ has done. He voluntarily gave up his glory to serve us. He suffered in agonizing death for us. Now he calls us to follow his example as well. We willingly experience these sufferings, temporarily I say, because Colossians 3.23, which was just read, we have an inheritance coming. We work with the end in mind. We enjoy here with the end in mind. There was something somebody said to me, I don't know who had said it, but I've got the quote here and I don't know who to attribute it to, but it really impacted me when I was suffering at work. It said, this is the quote that really changed the way I think. The moment I stopped praying, this person said, the moment I stopped praying, God, save me, and instead prayed, God, use me, I felt free. The moment I stopped praying, God, save me, and prayed instead, God, use me, I felt free. So when we live and we work with integrity, people are going to hate us. And I'm sure there are many people here who have had examples where people have asked you to do something that you would go, that doesn't actually honor God, there is no integrity in that. And you didn't go with them and you suffered for it. Don't waste that suffering, John Piper would say. Fourth thing, we work, our calling, we work with a healthy balance. Now, what do I mean by that? We don't work seven days a week and not have any time off. God worked six days and took a day of rest as a pattern for us to follow. As we work, we also need to rest. If we are working seven days a week, then we are actually not doing good to someone else, our families, our friends, even ourselves. We're actually saying to God, I actually don't fully trust you. I need to do all of these things, otherwise I won't get this. We need to have a healthy balance. Now, that's going to look different for everybody. Some people have different capacities to other people. And so also, there's no point in saying that, look, there's my friend doing this role and I'm doing the same role, but how are they pulling at all this work and I'm not? I should be doing the same level. It's not healthy to think like that. God has given you a particular capacity. Learn to work out what it is and rest when you need to. In my old job prior to coming to here, I said to my old boss, Stu, he's, he's an older guy, all his four kids are over the age of 18, and he would work like 70 hours a week. And I was trying to match that because I just thought that that's what he expected. After about six months, I said to Stu, I said, mate, I'm, I'm feeling pretty burnt out. And he's like, why? And I go, I don't. He's like, let me see your calendar. How are you working? And I showed him. And he goes, why are you doing this? And I said, I don't know. Isn't that what you expect of me? And he's like, mate, we're at different life stages. We have different capacities. You need to rest. Because if you don't rest, then you can't be a blessing to others. So we work with a healthy balance. Now I'm going to wrap it up with a conclusion and then I'll hand it over to you with um, some questions. I want to say this, whatever your vocation is, whatever your calling is, God calls you friends to honour him, to reflect his image, and to work with all your might. Now you might not have your dream job, but the secret is to honour God in the little things. You know, he's calling the cop and the carpenter, the concrete layer and the, 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 the person who mows the lawn to experience their dignity of their work as he uses them. Teachers, lawyers, surgeons, he's calling them to experience the dignity of their work. Mothers, grandmothers who help their daughters, he's calling them to experience the dignity of that work and spread the influence of God's kingdom in the world. In the skills we express, in the products we make, we work in a way that we impact the world and we impact relationships and we are instruments of God's redeeming work in this world. I know you don't see it. You might be thinking, well, how does that person in Baker's Delight who's a Christian kind of impact? They do. Because they probably do their job with integrity. They do it with excellence. They do it with, as though they're working for the Lord. They have a healthy balance, which means they give it their best. We need to never forget this. 
We need to not belittle what it is that we do. Whatever it is that you do, you can't say, I'm just this. Think about it. Imagine saying, I'm just a tent maker. I wonder what Paul would think. Or I'm just a fisherman. What Peter might think. Or I'm just a carpenter. What Jesus might think. When we use our gifts that God has given us in whatever capacity he's placed us in and he's called us in, that gives God pleasure. It gives us purpose. Purpose that is plentiful in a variety of ways. Some of you are making money with awesome skills and success. Some of you paint beautifully and are artistic and some are working on music. Some work on massive projects. Some people restore people's health. Some are in construction and transportation. Some of you are gifted salespeople who know that until someone sells something, no employer can employ anyone and no employee can provide for any loved one. Some of you are teachers who help children learn and find the path to their own dignity and purpose and paint their worldview and shape their worldview, which then shapes our civilization. When we consider the diversity of our tasks and our talents that God gives us, this is awesome. We serve an awesome God. This is why he allows us to enjoy this work and he wants us to enjoy this work. There is a dignity in what you do. Now, friends, that's it. I figured if you have your phones and you want to take some photos of some, res some resources, there's like 50 I could give you, but these three books are different in their approach and helpful if you're ever looking at it. The, the first one kind of looks at it as a way in which, so every waking hour, looks at it kind of like, almost like what I've said, but has a different approach and says that there are different reasons for why we would work. We all kind of land in the same way where we're saying that we all work to kind of promote God's excellences in the world. Timothy Keller has a very similar approach to that. Grace at Work thinks a little bit differently from memory. I read that so many years ago. Um, I should have done this before I got here, actually. <laughs> Brian Chappell, he's, out of all three of these books, Brian Chappell's book is laid out the best. It's the clearest to follow through. The first two books are harder to work through, but, the, but Timothy Keller's book is great to just kind of go, oh, yep, I can look at that chapter and that's it. The Grace at Work, you have to kind of work through it. But when you do, it is beautiful as he unpacks it. Um, this guy here, uh, Daniel Doriani, he does a lot of work and he looks at it from kind of the perspective of the reformers, Martin Luther, John Calvin. He quotes them because like Luther says, uh, some pretty good quotes, but when you unpack them, they're like, oh, actually, they're pretty dangerous about quotes, uh, about work. Uh, nonetheless, still very helpful. Please use them, glean them. I've got a whole bunch at home. If you want to talk to me later, I can uh, help you out in, I don't know, looking at understanding work more because this was just a teaser. Now over to you. There's going to be some roving mics. I'll let them go around. Mal's got one and Ben's got one. I'm going to hand this hat okay. back so that everyone knows who it is they go to. So, oh yes, we've got the microphone. I just want to say before we start, uh, working with Dan as his boss, I can tell you the $13 million was not my money, and I've got no... no yeah. Oh, so yeah, this was years ago, right? Record, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you cleared that up. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any questions, you just want to put your hand up and I'll, I'll come to you, or oh, Ben. Yep. You've probably answered it, but in ministry particularly, how easy is it to become a workaholic? Ministry so involved that family is neglected yeah it it's very easy that's a really good question it's so easy to become a workaholic and actually not work on my own walk with the lord uh you think that uh i don't know if other pastors have experienced it i have where oh look i'm waking up i'm reading my bible for the preparation of that week and i it actually it feels like i'm actually just doing work and i'm not actually walking with the lord and that can be fairly easy uh, and you start to feel fairly guilty because you're going, a lot of people are putting money aside so that I can do this for them. And I don't want to kind of be wasteful of all the effort that people are putting in to kind of make, to pay my wage, so to speak. So it's fairly easy to fall into that trap. But I think it's just as easy to fall in that trap in any line of work. If you're working in the service industry, in finance, uh, it's very easy for people to say, 
oh, look, you know, we're not like government workers where you rock up at nine and you finish at five. Uh, if you do, then you're the first one out when we're starting to sack people and so you end up becoming a workaholic. That was, that was me in the finance industry as well. Yeah, de definitely easy to do that. Did I answer your question? Okay, good. Missionaries, yes, absolutely. And it's because we have this burden, we're like, oh, they need to hear the gospel, they need to hear the gospel. One of my lecturers at Moore College used to say, sometimes 70% is good enough. Which is why if we remember that God is sovereign, that even in those moments we can just say, God, I, I need to rest and I trust that you've got this because it's your world anyway. Question over there? Yeah, go for it. Uh, how do you know if the work that you're doing is work that glorifies the Lord? Um, and That's the question I left out. That's good. And um, it's like going back to that example that you had with EY, um, yep. you know, you're work, you've been working for this company but then you figure out that if this is what the values of the company is, um, yeah, are you still glorifying the Lord by working for a company like that? Yep, it's, that's a tricky situation and that comes, like that'll also be with as you read your scriptures to work out whether or not your conscience is seared a particular way. So some people are like, yeah, I'm happy to work for a company. Like, I mean, I could probably work for this company that makes these t-shirts. Some might say no because of maybe some ethical, unethical, some, I don't know, somewhere down the line. People will fall in different spaces. But I think a good way to think about it is that verse that I had over here, where is it? You know how I said, oh, here, we'll just use this. The first thing I do is I go, um, whatever I do, can I do it as, as, as though I'm working for the Lord, this particular job, whatever it is. So say I am at the local drive, at Penrith Panthers where, you know, they go and collect the golf balls in the water and that kind of stuff in the driving range. Can I do this as though I'm working for the Lord? I, I think the answer to that is yes. Is it enough to just say yes to that and go, yep, cool, I'm in? No. There are other questions that might come up later. I'll give you an example. Say I got offered a job to go overseas uh, to Dubai to do some financial work and um, I'm like, can I do this as though I'm working for the Lord? The answer was yes. But the next question was, if I do this, how am I going to be relating with my family in a way? How will I minister to them? And will, it be sacri will, will that family relationship and my work with them or even my walk with the Lord be impacted because of the amount of hours that I have to put in there? And the answer was, it will be impacted. And so I said no to that job. Now, if I said yes to that, there are still other questions that I would also ask myself. But these first two, they gatekeep a lot of jobs out of the way like, or push a lot of jobs out of the way. Does that help? But there was a second part to your question, wasn't there? Yeah, and so that's going to be hard because we're working in a world where sometimes you're going to work for organized... I mean, if you think, think about just our public education system. I'm not being rude to teachers here who work in a public education system. I love teachers. It's not... The, the actual education system itself comes from a worldview that's anti-God. It's a naturalistic worldview. The entire way they think, as in the actual education system, is one that actually excludes God as a presupposition early on. Could I work for that? Yes. And I can still do good and I can still honor God in that. Does that help? Uh, I actually work for education, public education. It's <laughs> <laughs> good. Did I give you confidence to say, yeah, I can keep going? <laughs> I, again, I, please hear me. I am not actually attacking the education system. What I'm saying is we all have presuppositions. We all have these things that we... No one comes in naturally. The public education system automatically starts off with the assumption that God doesn't exist. That's how their curriculum is set. That's how they do science. That's how they do everything. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that the Christian education system might be any better. I'm not trying to promote one over the other. So again, I'm not promoting anything here. I'm just using an example to help answer that question. Now, there might be some jobs that I'd be like, what they're doing, there's nothing I can do that I would be like, yeah, I can get involved in that. Um, I'll give you an example. This is my conscience. I could never work for, you know, those uh, gambling companies and like tabs. They destroy families. I can't work for a casino. Even if it is that I'm selling alcohol, well, again, that's even, I wouldn't do that. My conscience, yep. 
question time. Cool. Uh, you mentioned uh, we work in the new creation. I was just wondering where you got that from the Bible, that's all. I, it's kind of alluded to in the Old Testament, but in Revelation chapter 22, verse 3 or 4, alludes to it from memory. And there's something in 2 Peter. I'll bring it up on my Bible. I'll read it. In the new creation, it says, No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. Cool. Follow-up question. Sorry. Yep. I, just, I, just, I knew that it was in there. I just wanted just you to say it. Um, it's good. It's good. <laughs> keep me sharp. It's Sorry, fine. man. Just keep me on your toes. But um, I just think... Do you think that any of... Because we do a lot of work in this life and yep. we're saved for good works, Ephesians 2, 10. Yep. Um, do you think any of our work in this life will contribute to the new creation? Oh. Oh, one of my lecturers at Moore College would say there is a difference between kind of ministerial work uh, and that that has actually lasting impact in eternity and that uh, normal work that we do as teachers or anything that might not have. I love him. His name is Peter Orr. Uh, I disagree with him in that I think there is an element in which when we do ministry work and we promote the gospel and we preach the gospel, yes, there is a kind of eternity at stake. But I think as a school teacher or as anybody who is actually living with those things in mind and working to honor the Lord Jesus, we impact people and we don't know the actual eternal ramifications of that work. So I think there are things that we do that will have eternal consequences even in our regular work and not ministry. Does that help? Excellent. David Jackson. Oh, this is going to be a curveball, isn't it? <laughs> Here we go. Okay. I started teaching in 72, so that's a long time ago. But in the process, you watch a culture shift. Um, and one of those culture shifts is since the 1990s, youth suicide's gone through the roof, uh, anxiety and the rest of it. But with that came a change in the way kids approached school uh, and post-school. So all of a sudden we had kids who, in my generation, you'd be desperate to get your driver's licence and be talking about your career back in year seven. Now you're 11 and 12, you ask, what do you want to do when you leave school? I don't know. Yep. Have a gap year. Um, with that comes um, the only reason to, take, to choose a subject in year 11 is if it'll make me more money. Mm. Uh, it's not Education is no longer about anything other than a job. Yep. And the government's pushing that enormously. Yep. So we have suicide rate, and we also have a bunch of kids who say, what's the point? That's right. Um, Solomon didn't know that there was an afterlife. Mm. Uh, and so when he looked at work, it was all his vanity, a chasing after wind. Yep. Um, now, I want to put that on one side and talk about your friend at Moore College. Okay. I've also watched since 1972 evangelicals go into the universities and tell university graduates, your career is a secular career, it's just a job. Uh, you want to get into spiritual ministry and things that last for eternity. Yep. Uh, I'm wondering, therefore, how we need to change our voice to our kids about the significance of work and their place as lay people yep. out in the community representing Jesus. This is what I wanted to touch on, and this is why we're doing this. It's very important. Our kids and the kids around us, not even our kids, the kids who are watching every single one of us do anything, whether it's planting strawberries or planting beetroots or doing any sort of work in creation, they are watching us and they are imitating us. And if we are constantly huffing and puffing, in the things that we do, we are sending a message to these kids that work is a product of the fall, work isn't something that should be good and cherished. But if, on the other hand, work, kids see us enjoy our work and do it well, and they ask questions like, why, why do you do that? Well, God has given me these beautiful gifts. I'm going to serve this community. This is a wonderful thing that God allows me to participate in. If they see that from many of us, time and time again, the generation will grow up in such a way that I believe will be impacted. I, I think about my nephew, who I, I, I bring this up a lot. I say to him, hey, who do you go for in the soccer? And he said, Arsenal. And I'm like, why do you go for Arsenal? And he's like, my dad loves Arsenal. He has no idea about soccer. 
but he wears the jerseys and he tells my kids, you should go for Arsenal. And I'm like, mate, stay out of this, all right? We follow the NFL at home. We don't watch the rugby or the soccer or any of that kind of stuff. What I'm trying to get at is our kids, the kids around us are watching everything we do. If your boss asks you to do something and it sucks, but you're not kind of being in that workaholic phase, do it and say to your kids, hey, I'm doing this because God calls us to work and work is a beautiful thing. It's something of value and dignity and I want to pass that on to you. And I hope that if we do that, that I think we'll change the next generation because they take everything from us before we actually speak it. That's my only... And apart from that and praying as much as we can that God wouldn't be working in their lives um, because it is a sad thing. Dan, I like Arsenal, so I'm just saying that. Sorry? I, I do like Arsenal too. So oh, do that's, uh, yeah, oh, I'm yeah, sorry. That's all good, buddy. Um, I've just, uh, we've got a, not so much a question here, but I got an email this morning from Tony, yep. uh, one of our valued uh, members here at the MBM family. So I'm just going to give Tony just an opportunity to share about work oh, from beautiful. somebody uh, who's still working. Excellent. Thank you. Um, people are either incredulous, mock me, or just absolutely incredulous. They really are. I'm coming up to 82. I'm still working between three and four and a half days a week. Amen. And I was the guy that said you work because you love it. One of the things that I've always worked out in the work-life balance, which is the, the full name of the last one, the point five up there, that um, four, um, which the world now tends to make a lot of money out of work-life balance and mm. devote time to your wife, devote time to your children. That's a given. We have to do that, particularly as men, as the spiritual heads of your family. Don't abdicate it and let your wife just do it. You've got to be in there. But the other thing when it comes to work is always allocate time to learn. Yes. Because when you go to school, when you go to university, and I've had a very privileged life as regards learning and, and education, it's important that you continually learn. The old adage of you only go to secondary school and more to university to learn how to learn. Mm. And that's what you have to do. And that's what you have to allow time for. If you're a street sweeper, be the best street sweeper in the district. Amen. If you're a financial controller, be the best one in the company and then strive to be the best one in the state, in Australia, in the world. Because that is using the gifts that God has given you in your mind, in your heart, in the desire that you have to fulfil your place in God's world. Amen. Thank you for sharing that. Can I touch on something that you probably alluded to and the fact that you're still working? Retirement. That's right. <laughs> the Bible knows no such thing as what our world calls retirement. It knows nothing like that. We're going to work in the new creation. Now, does that mean I need to work 70 hours a week when I'm 70, 82? No. It means that I might shift my job. Remember, work is more than just employment and getting money. It might mean that I might shift my things. And over those years, I have built up a set of skills that I'm now, I can pass on to somebody else and maybe do eight hours somewhere else, but we never stop working. In fact, when we do stop working, we end up actually just capitulating. There is no such thing as retirement as the world knows it, especially this new one, early retirement. And we wear it like a badge of honor. And I sit there and I go to these people who say this to me. I'm like, you want early retirement at 40? At 40, we just stop being idiots and you've got something to start passing on to somebody else and you're going to quit? So, yeah, you can see I'm passionate about that, right? There's two over there. Go for it. Yeah, I've got a question sort of off the back of this gentleman's over here. What would you say or what advice would you give to someone who does have that desire to work, that desire to glorify God and do all of the things up on the screen but feels they can't or really can't because they've got a disability or, you know, an injury that, or chronic pain or, you know, any number of reasons that actually prevents them from working and seems unfair yep. and feels that they're relying on the work of others to actually live rather than being able to contribute work themselves? I'll say a few things. That's hard. It would be hard because you have an innate desire to want to work because God created us that way and so that's right. But at the same time, I think from memory, Psalm 25 has this image of waiting for God or waiting on the Lord. 
I would essentially say, and it goes back to some things that we spoke about earlier in those lists, the eight lists I showed you as to why we work. Remember the first four were to serve others. I think this is where we come as a community and we, we should honour the people around us who can't work. Um, but obviously, also, if we can provide space for that person to work and enjoy that work, if it's paid employment or not. But um, if it's a disability, um, yeah, I think... We need to work hard at try and, trying to find a place for that person to work. If it's not a mental disability, or if, it, if they're mentally fully, like as in, I don't mean to be rude, but if they're there mentally, then there's a lot of jobs that they can do with their mind. If it's just a physical disability, uh, I don't mean to diminish it as in it just, I should remove that. If it's a physical disability, then, um, yeah, we're, but there's the mental space. But if it's uh, the mental thing, there might still be an ability for being, you know, physical um, there, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Please, how, I just want to ask how healthy is it for a Christian to be ambitious, um, to aspire to get to the top? Because at some point, definitely it gets political. Yes. So how healthy is it for us? How healthy is it to be ambitious? <sighs> depends. That's a very good question. It depends on who you ask. If you ask me, I would argue be as ambitious as you can be, but by not turning that thing into an idol. What I mean by that is that everything that God gives us that is good is a gift, but it is a gift and it is good. And all good things, if we make them as ultimate things, they become bad things. All good things, when we make them ultimate things, they become bad things. So by all means, I would argue be as ambitious as you can as you work for the Lord Aspire to get to, into that job that you can, if you have the capacity and the talents and all that kind of stuff, to be well paid for what you do, as for the Lord, and you will be a blessing with the, the finances that you would have, you would be a blessing to that community. On that, there is a question that I actually had, is all work the same? And I think that alludes to what I'm going to touch on, as hopefully it will help. Is all work the same? I want to say yes in one sense, in the eyes of God, in terms of its dignity and value and purpose, it's all the same, unless you're selling drugs and or, or the other kind of stuff, that the bad stuff, right? But apart from that, all honourable work is the same, but there is also a no to this. Not all work is the same in terms of its impact. And not work, I mean, if you think about it, if you're a manager of 150 people, you have the responsibility of 150 people that you need to care for. You are... Caring for 150 people, you have to put a lot more effort in that. And so therefore, the impact is bigger, the consequences are bigger. That said, if I'm, if I'm going so ambitious that I'm working 80 hours a week, I'm not with my wife, my kids are just going, they have this, if I were to ask your kids, uh, hey, draw a picture of dad, and all they draw is a picture of him with his bag at the front door and at the car, then that tells me that that's all they see, I'll be like, that's a dangerous image. That's me. Some might go, I can combat that. But I reckon our actions speak a lot louder than our words to our kids, especially if we want them, as what David was saying, we want them to understand the enjoyment of work, but also understand that God is still sovereign. So there's a balance at play. Yep. Um, so this is more like an advice question. But with a lot of us, I know, doing volunteer ministry and working a job at the same time, how do best do you recommend we like balance that time without falling into that workaholic mindset? Yeah, that's, that's big. Oh, I've got to think about that. How do you balance uh, your work and your ministry life? I want to say that all of life is worship and all of life, transfer that word to service, worship, service, ministry to God, whatever it might be. Um, that is between the person and their abilities and their circumstances. So I'll give you an example. If you're married and you have kids and you have a mortgage and you're doing 40 hours of volunteer work and 10 hours of work of paid and you can't afford to just serve your family, then I would say you need to make some changes because your primary ministry is those people that are around you. Again, this goes back to what David brought up. It's a big question because then your kids will see there's an imbalance of work and, uh, at work and rest and so on. But if you're a single person or if you're in a place, I've got a friend of mine who is a school teacher. He was able to knock off one day a week and earn less money and he contributed one whole day every week to his local church as a graphics art designer and as a musician. 
and he's doing extra work on Saturday and he's doing that and he can and nothing else is crumbling around him, then I would say go for it. Again, that your circumstances will dictate how you want to weigh that up. That doesn't help. I'm not giving you an answer. I'm giving you a tool. Yeah. Anyone else? Good questions, by the way. Thank you for keeping me on my toes. Well, there's one more. I'll go another one. Another theological one. Okay. I don't mind. I really liked how you mentioned you know, Genesis 1, image of God stuff. But I just thought in terms of verse 28, um, which is when God blesses them, he says, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Yep. Rule the fish you know, of the sea, birds of the sky, every creature. So the idea of subduing and ruling is in there. It sounds yep. like that's kind of our purpose of work. I just thought, did you want to speak to that at all? I can speak yeah. to that. Um, depends on who you speak to about how you think about that. Like as in, do we think that we're just going to rule over the fish now or are we kind of taking that and applying it? Is that what you're asking? Like what does that look like in our day and age? Um, it, it's, sorry. it seems like it's, again, about the role of humanity's purpose before f the fall came in. Yep. So the fall hasn't happened, yep. but the creation like mandate for God and humanity and why we were created is to do this ruling and, and subduing. By the way, this is still happening. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's why I think... So I, I guess one of the things I've been wrestling with this lately is that we, as evangelicals, we, we often sort of frame the gospel starting at Genesis 3. Like the yeah. fall happened, so we've got a problem, yep. and Jesus is the solution. Yep. And I think, of course, that's true, but I think it's bigger than that. That yeah, is, we we're saved in order to go back to the, the plan of God for our purpose, which is to rule and subdue and to work, which is why we're created for. Does that make sense? There, I want to say yes, but I also want to say we need to also be careful as to how we approach going back because although that happened before the fall, and I'm not disagreeing with you, that there's an element in which, and I'm going to unpack that in just a sec, we also need to see the new creation, where creation is headed, to work out actually what is it that God is doing and expecting of us. So sometimes as we look forward, it might dictate, oh, actually, what was happening in the garden before might not look the same now because it's headed in a slightly different direction. Does that make sense? Now, to that question here, I think the subduing and the filling of the earth is what he's calling his people to do is to cultivate the world, cultivate cultures, create societies, and go out and fill. That's why when you get to Genesis 11, the Tower of Babel, well, what are they doing? They're going up instead of going out and cultivating and creating societies and filling the world and actually proclaiming the excellencies of God everywhere. They were sticking in that one spot. Now, some people might disagree with me on that, that's how I see it. It's this element of co cultivating cultures and societies to the glory of God so that his excellencies spread. Yep. And yeah, we do that. And we still have a call to that to some degree. Yeah, totally agree. I, Can I, I add to that one thing? Yep. That what changes things is the kingdom of God language that starts to get used in the New Testament. And that is a lot of Christians say, we grow the kingdom of God which is almost like this kind of cultivating and creating these cultures. We as Christians, we don't grow the kingdom of God. It's his kingdom. He grows it. What we do is we point people to it. And as he chooses people and he brings them in, it grows. But we're still cultivating societies and cultures in a way that his kind of work is expanding, but he's the one who grows it. We don't grow it. I'll never pray the prayer, Lord, help. I'm going to grow your kingdom. I, I don't have that power. We don't as Christians have that power. So... I just wanted to add that in. Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I guess I, the picture we have of the new, the new creation in Revelation yep. seems to be this garden city. It's like Eden, but better. Yes. And so I feel like it's where God's taking the purpose is to this garden city. Correct. And our work is part of that purpose to take it there. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, if Adam and Eve didn't sin, essentially they would have been leading to what we see in Revelation. Like That's the promise. That if they continue to obey, that would be the blessing, everlasting life of that kind. Yes. We have a question at the back. Following on from Ivan's question, you commented in our work, we are working with God toward recreation. Yep. And my question is, I have no problem doing my work now for the Lord. Yep. And I know that I'm not called to paid ministry i'm called to secular work that's that's what i'm good for i'm not actually fit for other stuff can i stop you there yeah 
I don't like this secular and, and sacred divide. Okay. Uh, this is what I'm trying to actually uh, uh, dismantle in, in my talk. Yep. I, I'm living in Sydney, though. Yep. In Sydney, evangelicalism's always told me <laughs> otherwise. When we do that, can I, I, I'm going to interrupt your question. When we do that, we actually fall into the trap that our current culture has got us in. Yep. And the current culture has got us in this. Your faith is something that you keep separate to real life. Yeah. Happy with that. They say, keep it at home, because outside, it's reason. And they've kind of created this kind of dualism that I'm, I'm saying that we as Christians should go, no, 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 no. let's start here and say there's no dualism. All of uh, and so therefore sacred. as well, at the same time at home, like my faith impacts all of my life and I don't see my job as secular or I shouldn't see your job yeah. as secular. All of life is sacred, but... Yes. Including my work. Yes, it's set apart. Yes. Even, even if I'm a toilet cleaner, which I have been at times, um, or a dishwasher, or anyway, working with God toward recreation, do you think that my work now contributes to God's final new creation, or does it end with the heavens and the earth? It's, it's confined to this space, but... Like the kingdom of God, the new creation is something only God will bring about. I'm trying to figure out what you meant by that comment. Yeah, we're working with God as he continues to expand his kingdom, uh, as we continue to minister to people and proclaim his excellencies towards the fact that he's going to recreate everything. I, I actually don't think if I'm building buildings here, they're gonna, they, they will be in the new creation. If that's what you're asking, no. I don't think the cars that I make will be there. Um, but I think the people that we interact with as we work, as we continue to honour God in our work and proclaim his excellencies to a watching world that are impacted by that work, they will be there. Yep. Feel free, Mal, to chime in if uh, I'm... Yeah, I think we've got one more down here with Izzy and then we might wrap it up. Excellent. But, uh, and we're still early. Thank good. you. How do we stay Christ-centred in our motivation for the rest of our lives. Like a lot of our life we're working. How do we find meaning and purpose and keep grounded in that when when work is hard? When work is hard. When life is hard. Yep. When your boss is difficult. Yep. How do you how do you keep grounded in finding that meaning and hope and purpose? And, That's a very good question. And, and not just thinking, oh, I should retire young and just travel, and that's going to be a meaningful life. By the way, travel's okay. You might take a couple of months off. I'm not saying don't travel. But, um, yeah, the question is, yeah, for, for a life that's lived for Christ, how do we keep finding that meaning and purpose? That's a very good question. And I think I'll answer it by using Hebrews, but then I'll also speak about it in our lives and actually talk about our problems in our own kind of life and how we approach each other. And actually, that's what's hindering us from doing this. In Hebrews chapter 10, it says that, brothers and sisters, we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. So it talks about what we already have by this new and living way that's opened up for us, which is his body. And we have this priest over the house of God. And then there's a whole bunch of lettuces that comes up, come up in, from verse 22. He says, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart. Yeah, you can picture a lettuce leaf if you'd like, or six of them. Um, Let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. The next lettuce. Let us hold unswervingly to the faith we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. Those three lettuces are essentially the thing that help us combat the thing that's trying to get us away from God. Um, But the first thing is we're to be reminded of his grace. That's the thing that initiates this, hey, I want to draw near to him because he's already saved me. But notice it says, let us consider how we may spur one another on as we meet to love and to good deeds. And so here's the problem we have in our society. We don't share with our best friends or even our church family enough for people to help us. In other words, we don't actually work in such a way sometimes where we're carrying each other's burdens. It's almost like we're embarrassed to go up to my friend in church and say, hey, listen, I had an argument with my wife this week. 
and I'm really struggling and it's, it's impacting my entire work. That's seen as shameful and so I don't do that and therefore I don't have somebody to speak truth into that life, into my life. Truth that I might know but in that moment I'm blinded to and I need somebody around me. We are saved by Christ as individuals but we are saved into a community because we need each other. And the way in which that's going to work better is if we are loving to one another and caring and speaking to one another. Now, I want to put a very careful thing. I'm not suggesting that if you have a big problem that you go and tell 50 people. Uh, I don't think that's wise. I think you would have a select two or three people that you would share that they would help you and that they would be honest enough to go, you know what, sister, you need to do this and you might take it and it hurts, but the truth does hurt sometimes. I hope that helps. It's hard though. Leave Guys, it. let's thank Dan for uh, his outstanding presentation tonight. Thank you, brother. So we thank God for people like Dan who uh, put their hand to the plough and really worked hard to present tonight. So thank you very much, Dan. Thank Dan, you. I might just get you to commit us to the Lord in prayer as okay. we finish uh, this evening. Thank you. Father, we thank you so much that you, have, you are a creating God, the first creator, and you continue to sustain the universe through the power of your son, and you've called us to imitate you and work and love people, and you've called us as a people, as kind of priests in this world that are pointing others to your kingdom. Father, help us in whatever work that we do in this world. May we always see that it is a good gift from you and that we would enjoy it, and as a result of enjoying it, that we may praise you and worship you all the more, and that we would see others come to know you as a result of the work that we put in because the God that we serve. Father, help us this week when we feel like that's not the case and help us when we feel like our boss is being nasty and help us when at home when things are just rough to be reminded that you are there and that this is a good thing that you've called us to do. Amen.